Welcome to the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center's webinar series. This webinar is entitled Social Mission Metrics, Measuring the Social Mission of Dental, Medical, and Nursing Schools. And it was presented by Sonal Bartra with guest moderator Bianca Frogner on August 26, 2021. My name is David Armstrong, and I'm the director of the Health Workforce Tactical Assistance Center. Uh, today's event is the sixth in our series on health equity, and it focuses on social mission metrics. With that said, I'm now going to go ahead and turn over the event to our moderator, Bianca Frogner. Bianca is the director of the Center for Health Workforce Studies located at the University of Washington. Bianca? Thank you so much, David, and great to see everybody or hear, see names at least, <laughs> everybody today. Thanks for joining. Uh, as David said, my name is Bianca Frogner. Uh, I will be your moderator today. I direct the Center for Health Workforce Studies at University of Washington, where we house two Health Workforce Research Center grants, one focused on issues of health equity and another one on allied health. And quick fun fact, I actually uh, am really fun, uh, excited to see a speaker from George Washington University where I first actually got my start. So I actually uh, appreciate all the great work at George Washington University. Um, and and uh, I, I really credit where I am because of the great work that they do over there. So I want to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sonal Batra. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine uh, she's also holding a second appointment as an assistant professor of health policy and management. Uh, and she's presenting work today that is in uh, collaboration with the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity, as well as um, the Flex, uh, Beyond Flexner Alliance. Uh, Dr. Batra was formerly um, has held several positions, but among the things that she has done in her uh, roles in the past is that she's overseen emergency medicine residency curriculum, and that she's worked with the R Ronald Reagan Institute of Emergency Medicine to develop web-based curriculum for postgraduate training programs across India. So she and other and her colleagues have thought very deeply about uh, what it takes to develop great curriculum for our uh, future health profession professionals. And so today she'll be uh, sharing uh, the work that she's been doing with colleagues at George Washington University uh, about the social mission um, of health profession programs and talk specifically about their social mission metrics initiative that they've developed. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Batra to do her presentation, and then I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A for any questions to moderate the discussion afterwards. Go ahead, Dr. Batra. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you again for inviting me and, and having the opportunity to speak with this group about the social mission metrics initiative. Um, so you already just heard who I am, but I do want to acknowledge that there are quite a few members of our team that have made this possible, some listed here and, and others who have come and gone who may not be. Um, but this is really a broad initiative that is housed at the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity, which also has um, a couple of workforce research centers, as well as within the Beyond Flexner Alliance, um, which is an organization founded by my previous mentor and really the person who started this, which is Fitzhugh Mullen, um, and that organization is dedicated to advancing social mission in health professions education. And so since we keep talking about the term social mission, I wanted to make sure that I define that so that we are all on the same page. So this is the definition from the Beyond Flexner Alliance and that Dr. Mullen has published in the past. It's the contribution of a health profession school in its mission programs and the performance of its graduates, faculty, and leadership in advancing health equity and addressing the health disparities of the society in which it exists. And so social mission is really based on health equity and it's focused explicitly on the role of school or the educational institution in advancing health equity. Social mission metrics initiative is really a way to put some science behind the concept of social mission. And so what we set out to do was create a free system of metrics to assess the social mission, uh, at least to begin with, of dental, medical, and nursing schools. This is an initiative that has been funded um, for several years now by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as with support from HRSA, both through the Health Workforce Research Centers um, and, and outside of that as well. As I mentioned, this was um, based in the work of the Beyond Flexner Alliance, and I'll talk a bit more about the history of it momentarily. Um, and then we've had ongoing support from the Center for Survey Research at the University of Virginia. 
I put the website at the bottom and perhaps um, we can try to share that in the chat later on as well. And because it does provide a lot more information than I can um, give in this brief summary, though, um, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards as well. So going back to how this all came about, some of you may be familiar with this paper. Um, this was published, uh, I think, 11 years ago now um, by Dr. Mullen and colleagues. And it really was um, a, I think, landmark study in terms of advancing the concept of social mission. So it ranked medical schools based on their social mission, which was defined by what their graduates were doing once they finished. Um, and they created a composite score, including looking at how many, what, percent, what percentage of their graduates were working as primary care physician, what percentage were practicing in HIPSAs, and then what percentage were underrepresented minorities. Um, this was, um, as you can imagine, controversial because it did put a ranking on schools and it ranked schools that are often recognized for their excellence um, in many cases at the bottom. And so it, um, while there was some pushback against, as I wasn't involved in, but as Dr. Mullen and Dr. Chen would tell me, um, there was occasionally some pushback, pushback in regards to methodology or why those outcomes were chosen or you know why not others. There were also the sense, especially from schools who did well, of saying, look, we're actually being recognized for something. Um, and something really important, a contribution to the healthcare system that is exceedingly valuable that doesn't always get recognition um, the way it should. And so this study looked at particular outcomes, graduate outcomes. Um, over the next several years, Dr. Mullen and others were thinking more about what are the processes? So what goes into um, producing those outcomes as well as other outcomes that are important contributions of a school or health equity. And that's really where the idea of the social mission metrics initiative came up. What are the structures, the processes, the policies that help contribute to health equity outcomes, both as measured by what its graduates are doing, but also um, you know, anything else a school can contribute in terms of its current um, work, its research, et cetera, in terms of health equity. So the Social Mission Metrics Initiative began five years ago, um, again with a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we started by getting together a group of experts. We went through a modified process to develop the content. So what is social mission? What are all of the different things that a school can do um, to manifest its social mission? And when we started this back in 2016, we did not initially envision this as a survey. We were hoping to do something a little bit more akin to that rankings paper where we were using external data sources um, to look at what schools were doing. But once we got this group of folks together, and this included um, deans of schools of the three disciplines that I mentioned, it included national experts on health equity, social mission, on measurement, and others, we realized that the type of information that we wanted to include that was important to include to measure social mission was stuff that was um, not going to be readily available <clears throat> through external data sets. So looking at what schools were doing in their curriculum, measures of institutional culture and climate, um, what the research portfolio contained. Um, and so it developed into a survey um, and turned into a self-assessment process for schools. So schools would actually answer questions about their social mission, um, and then we would analyze those. And so over the next couple of years, we developed this survey. We worked with the Center for Survey Research and others. We did several rounds of um, field tests. We did some site visits to see how it performed in the field. We did um, feedback discussions with participating schools in the early phases. And then that led into 2019 when we conducted a national self-assessment campaign. And in that year, we invited all dental schools, all medical schools, MD and DO granting uh, medical schools, and uh, a subset of about 430 nursing schools, specifically those that had programs at the baccalaureate or master's level to participate. We did limit it at that phase um, and include programs for nursing that only had associate's degree nursing programs, although we're doing so in this upcoming year. Um, and we didn't invite all 700 and something nursing schools that fit that master's or baccalaureate description because we um, didn't have the manpower essentially. And the sample was much larger than dentistry or medicine. So we um, did a purpose of sample. 
And then in 2020, we met with schools who participated in the self-assessment, talked to them about the impact that it had. Um, we've done some validation work, which I'll talk about. And now we're in the process of refining and streamlining the survey and retesting it, as well as doing some strategic planning for the future of this project. So delving into each of those just a bit. Um, so these are 18 areas um, that made its way into the metrics. Each of these 18 areas had at least one indicator that was used as the measure for how a school was performing in terms of social mission. In the current iteration, um, we've gone through a number of steps to refine and streamline, as I mentioned, the survey. And so some of these areas have actually been removed, um, specifically targeted education, which includes things like um, if a school has programs for other types of um, staff or professional training, such as uh, nursing aides or dental hygienists, um, and global health was also removed. And, and we can talk about some of those reasons if people are interested. This is an example of the feedback that schools were provided at the end of 2019 when they participated in the survey. And so it is um, has some similarities to that initial rankings paper, but it also has some important differences. Um, one of the key differences is that this was confidential and provided only to schools, um, only to that school. And so it did not provide any type of publicly available ranking, but it did provide some important benchmarking information, which um, deans and leaders of schools had told us was really helpful and important to them to see how they were performing compared to other schools. So on the left hand side um, was sort of an overall result in terms of how they performed compared to all schools, as well as those within their profession. And on the right hand side, um, again in quartiles, it gave a breakdown of each of those 18 areas, again comparative in terms of how they performed relative to the rest of the participating cohort. In addition to the primary intention, which was to provide this uh, self-assessment feedback data, it also allowed us to um, get a scope of what social mission looked like at that time uh, across the US in participating schools. And so this is an example of what I mean by that when we looked at some of the aggregate results. So we asked schools um, whether or not they had access to a community health needs assessment. And we gave some examples in the actual text of saying, you know, this could be something at an affiliated hospital or affiliated health center or um, local government. Um, but just do you, do you have one? Have you conducted one? Most had either formal or informal. And then the follow-up question was, does your curriculum um, is your curriculum informed by that community health needs assessment? And a much smaller percentage um, said that it was moderately or substantially informed that by that community health needs assessment. We also were able to look at some comparative data across those disciplines. So we, uh, across those professions, excuse me, dentistry, medicine, and nursing. Um, in these, we broke it down further between um, DO and MD schools, as well as um, nursing pro graduate programs and nursing baccalaureate programs. Um, and we found that in each of the 18 areas, there were differences in terms of how the professions performed. Um, there were relative strengths for all three of those professions or all five of the groups that are listed here. And this is just a small sample of some of those original areas. We um, have used the, a similar methodology as was put into that rankings paper I think, with um, collaboration from the Graham Center, who worked on that first paper as well, to do some external validation of the, um, of the social mission metrics indicators. And so this is not um, you know, a full description of what we find, but just sort of an overview. We found that performance on particular social mission metrics indicators and areas that were positively associated with each of these outcomes. Not every indicator and not every area was positively associated. And this has helped us with our streamlining and revisions of our survey this year, where we were able to um, remove areas where they weren't actually associated with health equity outcomes. Although we are also cognizant of the fact that these are not the only possible outcomes that we might look at. And so there were some indicators or areas that we chose to keep in the next iteration of the survey even though they were not associated with one of these outcomes um, for a variety of reasons. We've done several surveys of um, stakeholder priorities, 
and looked at other sources of data to support some of the indicators that weren't associated with one of these outcomes. Um, I just want to point out that in addition to the um, medical school graduates, we were able to do a, sim a very similar analysis using 2019 American Dental Association data due to uh, support from the ADA in order to um, calculate, for example, the percentage of dental graduates who were accepting Medicaid, which we found was um, positively associated with the medical schools where their curriculum was in fact aligned with community needs. I also want to note that we were not able to perform a similar analysis for nursing schools, at least not yet. Um, there is, um, as I'm sure many people know, there's less ability to track nurses in terms of where they're working, how they're working, um, and tie it back to the school that they graduated from. And that's something that I know that many nursing organizations have been um, pushing for for a long time and are continuing to push for um, better data when it comes to nursing workforce outcomes. I mentioned that we are in the process this year of revising the survey and we're using a number of factors in order to do so. So one of the Health Workforce Research Center's uh, studies that was funded at GW a couple of years ago was looking at stakeholder priorities, we called it the pri social mission priority surveys. Um, we surveyed um, over 700 people um, it included those who participated in the Beyond Flex Neuroalliance Conference, as well as went through um, several student, national student organizations to ask these stakeholders um, to rate which social mission metrics were most important, which were least important. Uh, and we factored that into the current revisions. We also did a number of um, internal analyses um, and internal validation, and then looked at things like response rate and reporting board burden as well as, of course, just revising um, based on school feedback to remove redundancies. Um, and then I just talked about those external outcomes as well. I mentioned that this year, or last year, excuse me, in 2020, we um, talked to school leaders who had participated in the 2019 um, Social Mission Metrics Initiative to understand what the impact was. So we met with deans, um, Deans who had schools that performed at all four quartiles in terms of their overall um, performance on social mission metrics. So it wasn't just those who had done really well and were very eager to talk to us, though, of course, this was voluntary and so um, very much a selective sample. But we found a few themes in terms of its impact on schools. So the first theme was around data tracking. So because the survey asks about a lot of different areas of functioning deans or school leaders had to go through different offices in their schools to collect the data. And so it led to, in a number of cases, examples given to us of internal collaboration saying, you know, we didn't have our admissions folks talking to our curriculums folks in this way. Um, and we realized, you know, there's potential value in that in understanding the type of data that they're collecting. And there was a consistent request for um, repeating the survey. We are thinking about doing that in three to five years after the original survey um, pending you know, logistics. And then there was another theme of sharing with stakeholders. So this was used in a variety of ways. Um, and we stakeholders could include um, those that were at higher levels. So for example, boards of directors, presidents of universities or institutions, um, also with student groups and with others. And so sometimes this was used as a justification for current efforts. So saying, um, you know, we put a lot of energy funding um, and other engagement into trying to advance our health equity work or advance our diversity work. And here is this survey, the self-assessment that demonstrates that we're actually doing well in this. Uh, on the flip side, there was some cases where we were given examples of uh, leaders using this as a request for additional support, essentially saying we're not doing so well in this area and this is something that we want to prioritize um, or our students think is important or our faculty think is important. And here's um, some data to suggest that we really need to put more effort into this. And then there was a number of requests for resources for improvement. Um, and this is something that the Beyond Flexner Alliance and, and us and others are continuing to work on to make clear best practices, um, the ability to learn from other institutions, particularly and focus on specific areas that schools might identify as a priority for them. 
So in addition to sort of the core self-assessment work, there have been a number of other activities, um, particularly uh, those that were supported by the Health Workforce Research Centers. Um, so I already spoke a bit about the stakeholder priority surveys that were done in uh, 2019 to 2020. Um, also in that year, we conducted a review of accreditation standards in health professions education. So we looked at eight different accreditors um, and looked at the degree to which social mission content was present in those standards. Um, we are finishing up a study right now looking at the impact of COVID-19 on medical school pathway programs or sometimes called pipeline programs. Um, to really uh, start to understand some of the implications of this pandemic and what it might mean for future health workforce diversity and development. Uh, and now we're working in this upcoming year with um, talking to the ACGME about collaborating on looking at whether medical school social mission performance as measured on the social mission metrics initiative is associated with how their graduates perform um, in systems based practice during residency. So this is a one of those studies that accreditation studies where I just wanted to share some of the findings. Um, on the left hand side, you see all of the accrediting bodies that we looked at. So we included nursing, dentistry and medicine um, and as well as several others. And on uh, across the top, you see our 18 different areas of social mission. Um, and I'm not going to you know, talk through the specifics, but as you can sort of get an overall picture of is there was a wide variation in terms of the content that was included in accreditation standards. Um, some of this has made its way into the recent um, National Academy of Medicine Future of Nursing report um, as sort of one of part of their recommendations in terms of how to um, push the future of nursing in a way so that it is um, continuing to promote health equity. So thinking about next steps, um, we hope to continue to fuel the conversation and um, are doing that today, but also through a variety of methods in terms of convening publications, um, working with um, others, including the Pan American Health Organization on some global work that is similar to this. Um, we want to continue to stimulate interprofessional engagement because this is an opportunity for professions to come together to think about a shared goal. Um, we want to continue to provide benchmarks and learning opportunities. One of the biggest ways to do that is through repeat surveys, but there are also um, other opportunities, especially to share best practices. And then continuing to promote research on social mission and its measurement, as seen from the additional Health Workforce Research Center projects that came out of this, that there's a lot of different directions this can go and a lot of particular uses for the framework that go beyond um, the self-assessment by schools. And uh, that is all. I don't have a closing slide, it looks like. But that is all um, I have to share for now. And I'm very much looking forward to any questions or comments. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Batra. That was a really interesting presentation. Uh, even though I've heard a little bit about it before, I always feel like I'm learning something new. Um, and I do want to encourage folks to please um, add your questions into the Q&A box um, or in chat, but preferably in Q&A. So it's a little easier for me to capture and then I'll um, pose these to Dr. Batra. But maybe to kick things off while people are thinking about their questions. I mean, it's great to see some of the next steps that you were talking about, like trying to think about how these things connect to accreditation and lessons learned from COVID. Um, and I'm just going to pick up a little bit on one of the comments you made about getting a little bit more insight to the interprofessional piece of it. Is interprofessional education measured somewhere in the metrics currently? Yes, it is. Um, I'm, I don't want to, I'm trying to remember specifically in terms of our revisions because we did make some changes to that. So in the 2019 version, it was primarily in the curriculum, uh, in the area of curriculum, as well as I think in extracurricular. Um, so we asked questions around, of, you know, is there interprofessional education to which the answer was yes across the board as it is an accreditation requirement for all of the um, schools, but also then follow up questions. And that's a format that we use frequently, you know, oftentimes schools would answer yes to the base question. But then when you asked about, um, you know, is it incorporated across all years of the curriculum? Is it in, um, you know, not just in sort of lecture or classroom settings, but in applied settings? Well, there was much more variability in those. So, um, and then in the revised version, I think we also have some questions around interprofessional 
education in um, some of the faculty and student activism questions, I think. I'd have to go back and double check. Great. And maybe just following up, thinking a little bit about COVID's impact also and thinking about things that are going to be in the revised one, how much is remote learning going to also be a part of some of those metrics? And is that considered at all? Yeah, we have not um, considered remote learning as part of the metrics. I think um, one of the when we were doing the impact analysis, this was at the beginning of um, it's 2021 now. So I was actually like to in, in after the pandemic started, it was spring, um, summer of last year. And of course, every time we talked to a school, you know, there was COVID was the first thing that we talked about since that was one's mind. And so in addition to our primary goal of understanding the impact of the social mission metrics on schools, we also talked about um, with school leaders about how um, their social mission, um, they felt impacted the work they were doing related to COVID-19, whether that was transitioning to online learning, but also, um, as we know, many schools were involved and students and faculty were involved in community initiatives related to, you know, early on COVID-19 screening, testing, um, and, you know, more recently vaccination um, and others. And so um, there was a lot of discussion around how pre-existing um, social mission or focus on health equity or community relationships were impacting their response to COVID-19, mm -hmm. but we did not delve into um, learning modality changes and, and things like that. And I think, um, it's something that we can definitely can we should probably consider i also think in terms of um how that will continue to play out in the future it's so right. there's so much variability or um so much unknown that's so true so many universities are just starting to dive back into in person this fall and making decisions as um, I, I would say almost week to week these days as we watch carefully what COVID rates are like. Now I see a question that has come in and I'm going to just read it directly. So if an organization feels that it work, it's work Okay, let me try again. Uh, if an organization feels that its work aligns with the social mission and connecting interprofessional students to community-based work, how can we engage with the social metrics mission initiative to stay informed about the best practices being shared? So that's a great question. I think the um, best answer is through the Beyond Flexner Alliance. Um, so someone could probably find it or I can put it up in the chat, but the, the link to the Beyond Flexner Alliance website um, we can share because um, that's sort of the arm of this that is focused more on um, overall advancing the uptake of social mission, which of course includes staying informed about best practices. Um, they have pulled together sort of resource, page, resource pages. Um, and at the same time, part of this work that we're doing in, included uh, sort of a focus on nursing education. And um, we recently finished some case studies in nursing education to, um, highlight and to give some more description to schools that were performing or that were um, had initiatives that were doing really well in particular social mission areas. And so those are uh, hopefully will be published soon and were great examples of how different types of schools, you know, ranging from a community college to, you know, an a school that's part of, you know, a larger sort of Ivy League institution um, can um, engage with the community and can also um, use other best practices to advance social mission. Great. And, and just to check again, so how many schools participated in the 2019 self-assessment and how many schools were selected and recruited? And, and can you reflect a little bit what you expect then may happen in this next round? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 242 schools participated um, in 2019. Um, about half of those were nursing schools, 60-something uh, uh, medical schools and 20-something dental schools. That was about uh, a little over a third of all invited schools um, actually completed the survey. And it's important to note that the survey is, you know, unlike a survey monkey, you can <laughs> complete in a few minutes. Um, it was an intensive process. It was targeted to, uh, as I alluded to earlier, leadership at school. So it was typically sent to deans, although we would send to other contacts at schools if we had them. Um, and it took on average five to eight hours to complete. 
and involve collaborations with you know, multiple other offices and getting data from other sources. So it was an investment of time and effort in order to participate in the survey. And so um, the fact that we had, um, it was over a third of schools that um, were invited actually participating um, was, yeah. we felt a success. Um, that it was totally voluntary and you know no one was forcing them. And, um, and this was a brand new initiative. It hadn't been done in this way before. Um, we did have, a, we put a lot of effort, of course, into including them. And I think one of the things that helped significantly is that we had the support of many organizations um, promoting this, including, of course, the funder Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who wrote a letter um, to schools um, encouraging them to participate, but also organizations like the American Medical Student Association and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. I might have said the two A's wrong in that one. Um, the National League of Nursing um, and, and many others. And so um, I think having that um, foundation and organizational support um, really did help demonstrate um, to schools the value. And the reason we had that support was because individual schools were going to those organizations and saying, you know, hey, we think this is important. Um, prior to that, we had between several rounds of field testing, over 70 schools participate in field tests um, and revisions. And so it had already gotten um, some traction from that earlier on. All right, so I agree. Getting that kind of response rate, given how much time and energy is put into it by that level of leadership is very impressive. And really uh, your team should be commended for that effort. Uh, and I'm just so, I mean, maybe I miss it a little bit. So when you provide those reports back of rankings or where the star rankings relative to where others are performing. So is it only those who participate who can get then that feedback? Yes, it was all that eventually more people will participate and you can do this for more people, more, more schools. Exactly right. So um, in 2019, those 242 schools received um, an individualized confidential feedback report um, and the benchmark. So, you know, how what quartile they performed in was in comparison to the other 241 schools that participated. Um, and while those were confidential, so, you know, if George Washington, for example, were to participate, the report would be sent to the Dean of George Washington and to no one else. So they might see they're in the fourth quartile or the first quartile or, you know, whatever. Um, that's obviously a made up example. And so, um, but they won't know what, you know, the next school over um, how they responded and, and where they performed. So it's really in intentioned to be um, self-assessment and, and feedback um, for purposes of uh, change and improvement. Now that said, um, schools, once we sent that report, the schools owned that report and so could do with it what they want. So they could share it with their student body, they could share it with leaders. And we have had some schools um, who have put it on their websites um, and are, you know, it, it's become somewhat of a, you know, recruiting thing. Obviously it's going to be schools that do well, although, um, you know, we have acknowledged that we likely have a selective sample of schools um, who chose to participate in this initiative. Um, there were many who wanted to participate, you know, said that they wanted to participate, but given the time commitment and, and given, um, you know, everything else going on may not have been able to that we hope will be able to in this future iteration. That, that's great. I, I can see how um, as more schools take participate, they get these reports back and they see value and you're able to show value that other universities are finding in it that perhaps that may increase the response. So I, I'm curious from the number of metrics that are being collected, were there some that you thought, you know, that you were surprised weren't easily available while others were harder to get. So maybe focusing a little bit more on which ones were you surprised were not more readily available because those seem like opportunities as a community for us to work on perhaps to, to get more uniform data across the country. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the surprises, including some of the data on compositional diversity, um, you know, we know that data is reported to numerous other sources, um, you know, the the Department of Education and creditors and others. Um, and so, you know, we've sort of thought about how we want to approach that in the future, because that is one item that we can get from elsewhere and don't necessarily need schools to um, answer, at least not in every profession. Um, we asked about compositional diversity of students, of faculty and academic leadership. Um, 
And some of those latter ones are not as readily available from other sources as students. But one and most schools were able to answer that. It was just, um, you know, sometimes it, it took a little back and forth and we were available for um, sort of technical support for schools. But the follow up questions, again, um, included questions around graduation rates, for example, of students by group um, and so by race and ethnicity. But we also asked about graduation rates of students who were first generation to go to college um, and other measures of socioeconomic status. And then um, we asked schools whether or not they had a defined community commitment, which um, was a particular group, whether that's geographic or um, a population that was a target um, for sort of health improvement of their school and, and whether they then had students from that community of commitment at their school and then what their graduation rates were. And so once you got to those levels of question, especially on graduation rate, even by race and ethnicity, they were often um, difficult to get. Um, but from the schools that did answer those questions, we did find um, differences, systematic differences in graduation rates um, across race and ethnicity um, that were are not going to be surprising. So we found that, that groups that are underrepresented, for example, in medicine had lower graduation rates. Um, and there were some differences in um, the three professions as to what degree, but the data again is a little limited because I think only about 50 something percent of schools um, were able to consistently answer those questions. So it's still data from 120 odd schools. Um, and there are some other sources of that as well, but um, it's not as easy to come by as, as we thought it might be. Sure, that's, that's great. Well, uh, maybe could you speak a little bit to um, why you chose these initial professions and what other ones have been considered? And uh, just adding to that a little bit to, um, you know, community colleges, it sounds like you're going to go to the associate degree programs in nursing, but community colleges play a fairly large role in uh, training a good portion of our health workforce. So just kind of included in there is, is it seems like the focus has been more at the bachelor's and master's level. So I'd love to hear a little bit more too about thinking about how do you measure social metrics for uh, programs that may be uh, addressing maybe the associate's degree level. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, in terms of the history of this project, it kind of grew out of that medical school rankings paper. Um, and so initially there was, um, it, it was thought of, you know, should this be for initially anyway for medical schools, um, it, it became very clear um, in early discussions that obviously the concept of social mission and of the need for health professionals to contribute to health equity is, um, you know, universal across health professions. And so um, initially we decided to focus on um, those three disciplines. Nursing is it's the largest of the health professions and has sort of, you know, a really large role and potential role in terms of advancing health equity. Um, and then medicine and dentistry is sort of two um, diagnosis, diagnosing and treating um, professions that had sort of comparable um, educational programs, um, and the initial thought was we could expand it to others after that. Um, there's been interest from a number of other professions or other school types, including pharmacy, PA, um, public health, um, physical therapy, and others We've gotten sort of reach out from individual people, sometimes from organizations saying, you know, hey, we think we should expand it. And we've thought about doing that. Um, it will take some effort. And so it's just a matter of sort of um, getting that moving. The one where we have moved most actively in is with the um, associate's degree nursing program. So um, the organization for associate's degree nursing, ODIN, um, has been really invested in the concept of social mission and health equity. Um, and we have been working with them to adapt the survey for that group. Because it was designed with people from those three professions, the initial three professions, um, you know, we want to acknowledge that um, just giving it sort of having it be used as it is wholesale with other professions isn't necessarily the most appropriate strategy and really should be um, a process in terms of making sure that it is appropriate and that we're measuring the right things. Um, and so we went through that process with ADN schools um, or ADN programs and are in our pilot that hopefully we'll, we're sending out invitations next week. Um, 
are including those programs, which are often based at community colleges. Um, and there's, you know, lots of work in a, at our workforce uh, research center. We're doing some work on the role of community colleges in um, particularly health workforce diversity um, and then broader implications for health equity. Um, right now, we don't have particular metrics and we've learned from, you know, this process, maybe it should have been really obvious to begin with, but it's complex measuring things, you know, across even the, the three professions because they function so differently. The structure of schools can vary widely from one school to another. And so, um, you know, each time you do that, I think you'd want to make sure that it was, again, appropriate um, and not just try to, you know, fit a square peg in a round hole. Sure, sure. So I know we're coming here to kind of the end of our uh, session, but I did want to uh, just have you talk a little bit about what uh, maybe just thinking a little bit about our audience too is how can what is needed to get better uptake of the social uh, metrics uh, mission and thinking both about it sounds like, for example, you've talked about champions and working with these kind of stakeholder groups and um, and, and it sounds like there's multiple parts. One is getting more survey participants and the other one is for people to actually use it. So what, what would you like to see as the next steps to really enhance uh, this social uh, metrics mission initiative? So I think that, um, you know, the overall goal is really to the overall goal is to improve health equity um, and sort of, you know, working backwards, we sort of have developed some logic models around this. And, um, you know, we do think that schools and educational institutions can play a role. And um, by considering all aspects of their social mission, you know, we think that that will lead to um, advancing health equity. So the social mission metrics initiative, um, in some ways, is a means to an end, right? So, you know, we, we don't really need people to do this just to do it. Um, we want schools to participate if it will um, help them advance their social mission and contribute towards health equity. Um, and so in order to increase uptake, I think of the concept of social mission, social mission metrics is one tool, um, but there are others in terms of, as you mentioned, engaging champions and finding those champions at individual institutions and supporting them. Um, and the metrics initiative can do that, right? It, we've seen examples of how it can provide support for champions saying like, hey, here's this, this data because, um, you know, of course, leaders of schools don't want to be in the first quartile in anything. Um, and so it can be used um, in, in sort of an incentivizing or motivating way. Um, I think having um, more people talking about the concept of social mission and the role that schools can play in health equity, um, whether that's at, you know, conferences, at meetings, at over coffee, like we don't have coffee anymore, um, but what, in whatever format I think um, is important. But then I also think at a policy level, um, you know, so accreditation is, is one example. Um, when we, there have been many examples in the past of um, things that have been added to accreditation standards and the impact that it has on what schools do, right? Schools need to be accredited. And so um, thinking about policies that could help promote social mission and accreditation being one of them, funding mechanisms being others um, in to really um, make social mission sort of a mandatory part of what a school does in order to continue to, to be successful, um, I think is, um, is really what's gonna be required. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Batras, thank you so much for this conversation. And thank you to everybody by, for being here today. And I'm going to turn this over to David to take us out uh, of, of today's presentation. Well, real quickly, I'll just iterate what you had to say. This is a very interesting presentation, Sonal. Thank you for presenting this very important information. It's, it's on a very relevant topic. And Bianca, once more, uh, as always, thanks for moderating today's event. Uh, you did a wonderful job as always. And, and for those of you in the audience, thank you for attending today's event. Uh, this webinar was recorded. We'll have a video up on our website at healthworkforcetea.org in about a week. And with that said, I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Take care. And once more, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you for watching the webinar. To view our extensive webinar library and other helpful resources, please visit us at healthworkforcetea.org.